one of the things that I really wanted to do with You Are the Placebo is show the evidence that people can truly transform themselves. So breaking the habit of being yourself is really a how-to manual, the basics of changing from an old identity into a new identity, breaking the habit of the old self and reinventing the new self. And it was based on some of the workshops that we did around the world that were introductory workshops. Standing on the shoulders of those workshops, we did more advanced workshops, and we measured transformation. And if you can measure transformation, and you can prove empirically that people can change from the inside out, then it gives permission for other people to do the same. So, You Are the Placebo is more of an extension of Breaking the Habit. Well, I'm o I've always been interested in the placebo, but one of the things that started happening in our workshops is we started seeing people with different chronic conditions like MS and lupus and celiac disease and chronic pain and food allergies and Hashimoto syndrome and even some cancers. We were seeing people's health change right during a workshop. So I began to think, how can you give someone a sugar pill, a saline injection, or perform some false treatment or procedure. And a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender without any analysis that they're getting a real substance or treatment. And they'll begin to program their own autonomic nervous system to make their own pharmacy of chemicals that matches the exact substance that they think they're taking. So if I'm seeing the effects taking place in our workshops, I thought if I could study the placebo and look at what science has to say about what the elements are that demystify the process, if I could understand the scientific methodology, maybe we can teach the placebo and get even greater results. So instead of the person putting their faith and belief in something outside of them, maybe they can put their faith and belief in something inside of them or in a potential that already exists in the quantum field and begin to take, instead of something that is known that produces a result, take something that is unknown and can continuously re revisit it until it becomes a known. It turns out you can teach the placebo. So I think it's a great way for people to identify with the concept of self-healing and using the same principles to get the same results. Well, no one knows for sure, but uh, there are certain elements that allow certain people to respond to a placebo. And I'll talk about those uh, step by step. One of the things that separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And when people are more analytical, they're less suggestible to a thought or some type of treatment. A person is less analytical, then they're more suggestible in getting some type of influence in their brain and body. So suggestibility is inversely related to um, uh, anal the analytical mind. The second thing is that if you've been conditioned into a pill becoming the symbol of something for treatment, and you keep giving someone a pill for a pain. It's called conditioning. They'll associate that pill with reduction in pain. And if they've taken enough pills and had enough experiences, they will begin to create an associative memory that that external substance is producing some internal change. And over time, you can replace that real substance with a fake substance. And many people will have the same response, but it's based on their past. So conditioning is based on the past. And certain people who have been conditioned to believe that a doctor is the authority, to believe that pills and chemicals heal them, to believe that a hospital is a place where you go for treatment, to believe that uh, whatever, whatever a, a healthcare practitioner tells you is the truth. The belief is based on past experiences and conditioning is based on past experiences. Now, another group of people 
will respond to what we call expectation, which is based on the future. So when a person begins to get a pill or a substance, and they begin to associate that pill with the possibility of being better, then sooner or later, once they have the image in their brain that they could be better, that's called intention, and they get excited or enthusiastic, or they become um, inspired, the moment you marry a clear intention with an elevated emotion, your brain and body are no longer living in the past. Now they're living in the future. And a certain percentage of those people can actually change their physiology by marrying those two elements. So certain people are conditioned and it responds to the past experience. And certain people are, are imaginative enough to begin to select the idea that they could be better and marry it with an elevated emotion. And Thoughts of the language of the brain and feelings of the language of the body. So how you think and how you feel creates a new state of being. The third thing or fourth thing that could produce some effect for certain people is what we call assigning meaning to things. Which means if I tell you what a certain medication is going to do and I'm absolutely congruent and clear and enthusiastic that these are the things that'll, that'll take place when you take this substance, a person who has very little analytical facilities will accept, believe, and surrender without any analysis to the images that are created from the idea that they're assigning meaning to some outcome. So the more you know the why and the what, the easier the how becomes. So those are the elements that allow people to become more suggestible to the placebo. Well, <clears throat> we use meditation as a model because one of the whole purposes of meditation is to get beyond your analytical mind. And so if the conscious mind is separated from the subconscious mind by the analytical mind, and the subconscious mind makes up 95% of most people's behaviors, thoughts, emotional reactions, beliefs, and perceptions, by the time they're 35 years old, then in order for them to change those programs, they have to get beyond the analytical mind, beyond the conscious mind, and enter into the operating system. And that's what meditation does. So we use the meditation, meditative model because most people have all of their attention on their external environment. They have all their attention on their body, and they're always preoccupied with time, the body, the environment, and time. When you meditate, you're doing the exact opposite you are excluding yourself from the external environment by closing your eyes and putting earplugs in your ears or playing soft music. Now that your brain is picking up less sensory data, all of a sudden your brain waves start to change and your inner world starts becoming more real than your outer world. If you put your body away, then you're no longer an identity. You're no longer a woman. You're no longer a man. You're no longer a mother. You're no longer a grandparent. You're no longer a, an attorney. You're no longer a nurse. Uh, you don't have a wardrobe, you don't drive a car. You get beyond your body and its associations. You transcend your identity that's connected to the environment. And for the most part, you lose track of time. And in that moment that you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, you become pure consciousness. You become a thought alone. So if you are going to heal yourself by thought alone, then you have to become thought alone. And meditation is the best way to put your attention on your inner world instead of on your outer world. And the research shows that when the inner world becomes more real than the outer world, the brain begins to reorganize itself neurologically. And if the thought in your mind becomes the experience, and the end product of an experience is called an emotion, now you're signaling your body with new chemical information and you're activating new genes in new ways. So now the brain and body are responding by thought alone. Well, it's the exact same reason we just said in the last question. The biggest reason that people have difficulty in changing is because most of their brain is organized to reflect everything they know from past experiences and experiences produce emotions. So people live by certain emotions that become very addictive. 
And so when it comes time to change, just like an addict that has to break their addiction to some substance, when a person is getting beyond their emotional self, their body is craving the same familiar emotions. And so they start out with really good intentions with their conscious mind. But in a very short amount of time, the moment they see a person or go to a place or they do something that they did yesterday, their body goes back into the past, back into those habituations, and they return back to those subconscious states again. So, if your personality creates your personal reality, and your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel, then the present personality who's listening to this little recording has created the present personal reality called their life. Which means if you want to create a new personal reality, you have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You have to begin to become aware of how you've been acting and behaving and modify it. You have to look at the emotions that you've memorized that keep you anchored to the past. And I think for most people, they try to create a new personal reality as the same personality that doesn't work. They literally have to become someone else. So when people are living by the hormones of stress and they're living in survival, and their body's creating the emotions of anger and aggression and hostility and fear and anger and judgment and hatred and uh, suffering and pain and guilt and hopelessness. Those are all created by the hormones of stress. And they cause us then to always try to do the same thing and expect a different result. In other words, we're always anticipating a future worst case scenario based on the memory of the past. Because in survival, you have to take care of your body. You have to put all of your attention on the external environment. And you better be aware of time. And so, out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, people select the worst potential. And they brace themselves for that outcome. And so, when we live by the hormones of stress, we become materialists. We're defining reality with our senses. And when we do that then, we limit possibility. So teaching people how to break the addiction and go within really is when they start to believe now that their thoughts have something to do with their destiny. And so turning that ship around for certain people usually requires that they hit crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis or loss. They have to get to the lowest point in their life before they decide to change. And my message is why wait? I mean, you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And people are waking up to this idea, and they're understanding that they could change their genetic expression because of the model of epigenetics. They could rewire their brain because of the understanding of neuroplasticity. They can change their immune system because of the principles of psychoneuroimmunology that there are infinite potentials in the quantum field that await them because of the understanding of quantum physics. And all of these elements in the new science point the finger at possibility. So there's a demystifying that has to go on that we're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives or that we're doomed by our genes. And when people begin to understand this, they begin to pay more attention to how they think, act, and feel. And as a result of that, they start to make some measurable changes in their lives.